So I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing uh, in Parkinson's and exercise uh, at the Cleveland Clinic and then other areas that we're expanding into as well from a geographical standpoint. So, um, you know, again, this is a, uh, intended to give you a little bit of a, a history of what we've done and then where we're going in the future in terms of our research. So I have two uh, research labs. One is at the Cleveland Clinic in, in uh, Cleveland. The other is in Las Vegas. So if there are any uh, residents from Las Vegas here, we have a, uh, a lab there that we're also looking for volunteers in research studies that we're doing uh, out there as well. So I want to talk just very briefly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide with respect to uh, Parkinson's. We all know it's a degeneration of the basal ganglia, et cetera, et cetera. But what I want to focus your attention on is the graph on the right there where the, the loss of dopamine neurons. And one of the things that we're really trying to do, and this is where uh, we have funding from the Finney Foundation to look at, is to, if we can identify uh, individuals early in the disease and then start to intervene as early as possible rather than later in the disease to try and change the slope of that line. So instead of having that red line be such a dramatic slope downward, we're trying to just alter it so it doesn't either, maybe it flattens out or just isn't quite as steep. So it's really one of our fundamental goals and the Finney Foundation has been critical in the support of that initial study. Uh, again, this is uh, something that many of you probably know. This is just a cartoon in terms of the the effectiveness of uh, medication over the years of Parkinson's. Typically, levodopa is very effective early in the disease in terms of uh, uh, treating the cardinal signs of Parkinson's, bradykinesia, akinesia, the slowness of movement and difficulty initiating movement and some uh, postural problems as well. But as the disease progresses, oftentimes uh, dyskinesias become a side effect of uh, extended levodopa use. So one of the things that we're trying to do, again, is try to see if we can potentially intervene earlier so we can maybe keep this window open longer and wider. So how do we do that? Well, if you look at the data and studies in animals, uh, there's a type of exercise called forced exercise that's been very effective and shown to be somewhat neuroprotective in uh, rats and mice, models of Parkinson's. So just to give you a little bit of a historical background on, on this research, what, what we do to create a Parkinsonian like rat or a mouse because they don't typically get Parkinson's is we give them some chemical, a 6-hydroxydopamine or MPTP depending on the species, and basically we make them Parkinsonian like. And when we then try to exercise them, if you put, put a, a healthy mouse on a, a, a running wheel, if anybody has a, a mouse or, or any pocket pets, as my daughter calls them, they will run on treadmills all day long. But once we give them the, uh, this drug to make them Parkinsonian, we put them on a treadmill or a running wheel and they don't move. So what we have to do and what my colleagues have done is, and if you look very carefully, on the uh, slide on the left, the figure on the left, uh, you can see that there's a motorized treadmill there. So you put them on the motorized treadmill and you would think that they would be able to run. Well, what happens, again, they don't want to run, so they fall off the back. So what some clever folks have done is, again, if you look carefully at the, at the uh, left figure there, you'll see some electric wires or grid. And so what we do, or what they do, is put the mouse or the rat on the treadmill and they turn it on, and if the mouse doesn't keep up, they get a little shock to, to help them to, to run. So that is called forced exercise. It's forced exercise because they are forcing the rat to run, or the mouse to run, at a rate faster than they would on their own um, if they just left them you know, on a treadmill or a running wheel. So, those studies have been exceedingly productive and very valuable in terms of uh, showing improvements in motor function and neuroprotection. Uh, there's a little different story, but it's changing, it's emerging with human studies. Uh, but in general, voluntary exercise in Parkinson's, um, there's abundance of liter literature uh, showing that there's benefits in terms of the cardiovascular benefits. So Parkinson's patients can improve from a cardiovascular standpoint in terms of uh, you know, after exercise. So all of those benefits are good. Uh, but there haven't been any uh, real definitive patterns with respect to the improvement of motor function or global motor function or 
um, real large clinical trials with respect to neuroprotection. And in fact, there was a Cochrane review um, uh, a, a few years back, and they said they concluded that there was insufficient evidence to support or refute the efficacy of exercise in Parkinson's disease. Now, another part of that review, they had two weaknesses. They said the uh, um, one, that the results were relatively small when they were found, and two, that they were not long lasting. Now, I will give it to the, the Cochrane Group to say that was, those are true, uh, accurate findings in the sense that they're not, they weren't very large, um, and there are a number of reasons for that, and we'll discuss those in a little bit. But the other one, that it's not long lasting, is a little bit of an unfair um, criticism of exercise, because my response to those individuals would be, well, you know, if we don't continue taking your medication, then the effects of medication are also not long lasting. And if you don't continue with deep brain stimulation, if you turn the stimulators off, those effects also are not long lasting. So I think the take home point here is that, you know, exercise is not the panacea. It's not going to be the cure uh, that you can exercise for eight weeks and then miraculously you're cured. But it becomes a lifestyle change and something that you have to embrace. And just like taking medication, on a daily basis, you probably need to engage in exercise on a regular basis. Poss probably not daily, necessarily, but uh, based on our studies, but it's certainly something that you have to in ingrain in your lifestyle. Um, so again, voluntary exercise improves health-related quality of life, strength, and balance, uh, but again, the impact on falls and depression uh, is not very clear. So these are things that we're looking at in our studies now is uh, fall rates and also these non-motor symptoms. Uh, but again, there's no systematic data out there with respect to human data and neuroprotection. And this is where our current study with the Finney Foundation uh, really is, I think, going to be a potential landmark study for us. So why are the mixed results? Why did the Cochrane Group say that there are small effects? Well, the varied exercise interventions uh, in terms of the dose some studies have patients exercising once a week, three times a week, five times a week. Uh, and the intensity, again, all over the board. You have to remember that many of these exercise studies are really funded on a shoestring budget by small organizations or even internal funds. And so they're not like a standard uh, multi-site clinical trial where you can actually you know, recruit a very sort of somewhat of a homogeneous uh, population. So I think we're evolving to that, where we actually can get NIH and other organizations to fund larger clinical trials to, so we can actually better understand the precise effects of exercise on Parkinson's and can we potentially slow its uh, uh, progression. Um, so again, these, this is why these studies have suffered. I get small sample sizes and mixed patient uh, characteristics. The other part is that all of these studies have used a voluntary mode of exercise. So when I say that, I, I compare that or contrast that with forced exercise, right? Forced exercise was where the, the rat or the animal was forced to, to exercise at a rate faster than they could voluntarily or on their own through the uh, administration of electricity. Now these studies have used voluntary exercise. Um, they could be rowing, they could be uh, any type of uh, weightlifting, any type of exercise that's voluntarily controlled by the patient. Um, and so that's, again, based on some of our observations and data, that may be an area of why, a uh, reason why some of these data have not come to uh, fruition. So the fundamental question that we're asking or that we're talking about today and in my lab is, is exercise really medicine for Parkinson's disease? So my insight or my interest really came in uh, 2003. And here are some, uh, just some pictures uh, that uh, you know, document our, our, our bi bicycle ride across the state of Iowa. So in 2003, on the upper left there, you'll see a small group of folks, uh, myself in the back, and then Ralph and Kathy Frazier in the front. Uh, this is when I was at Atlanta and uh, in Emory, at Emory and Georgia Tech. Uh, Ralph and Kathy were happily married. Uh, at the time, and uh, at that picture they were. Um, so the idea was that, you know, Ralph was a big cyclist, and uh, Kathy wanted to spend more time with Ralph, and we were at a holiday party, and possibly after a few cocktails, someone made the idea, or came up with the idea that, hey, why don't we ride a tandem bike across the state of Iowa? And Ralph and Kathy, husband and wife, can ride together, they can have this wonderful, beautiful moment. Um, 
And so that was a great idea in February, uh, and then it came July. So has anyone here ridden a tandem bike? Okay, we've got some hands, okay. Uh, have you ever ridden it with your spouse? So are you still married to that spouse? You know? <laughs> We've got a few head shakes, okay. So that was the problem. So what I didn't realize what a t what is that a tandem bicycle, and I think, I'll go on a tangent here. I think if you have, anybody has kids or grandkids who are thinking about getting married, I would give them a pre-wedding gift of uh, a day or two day rental on a tandem bike because I think what it does, it just accelerates you to the final destination of your relationship. Um, <laughs> so they can save a lot of time. Uh, so Ralph and Kathy, the idea was they were going to ride the tandem bike across the state of Iowa. We were going to raise awareness that Parkinson's isn't a death sentence. You can be active. Well, that was a great idea in theory. So uh, they made it through about the first half of the first day. Again, this is a seven-day ride. And uh, Ralph and Kathy had been chatting. Uh, and uh, Ralph actually got off the bike at the midpoint town and he forgot that Kathy was on the back. Um, so uh, she fell over and there were talk of divorce and everything else and here I am feeling bad that here I brought these, this couple here and now we're gonna have all these problems. So uh, being the good guy from Iowa, I said, hey Kathy, why don't I ride with you for the rest of today, just today. Um, and so it turned out that Kathy and I had a great time uh, on the tandem together, probably because we were not married and uh, I ended up riding with her for the rest of the week. And so a couple things happened. She said, when I was on the bike, it didn't feel like I had Parkinson's. And that's why I say, was it the pie or the pedaling? Because as we make our way across the state of Iowa, we eat a lot of pie and ice cream and things like that. Um, but then the other thing that happened that was very interesting was that she wrote out, or there was a birthday card at our campsite. And at the very back of that picture on, on upper left, is a guy named Gary, Gary McCarthy. And she wrote a card that said, Happy Birthday, Gary. And I looked at that, and I said, Who wrote this card? Because if you'll notice, there are just guys in the rest of the group, and other guys where I'm from don't write other guys' birthday cards. Um, and so she said, I did. Isn't it amazing? And I said, It is, because her handwriting looked beautiful. And so this was sort of our first you know, inkling that maybe there's something going on with this exercise. But again, at the time, I was a new assistant professor at Georgia Tech and very focused on deep brain stimulation, so this became just sort of a hobby. Um, and you can see it's grown since then. Uh, I think this past year we had about 70 patients, or 70 uh, individuals with us uh, to do this ride across Iowa. And in the middle there, you can see that uh, uh, I've evolved and now I have two children who ride across the state with me on a triple. Uh, this is a movement disorders neurologist uh, who rode with us one, er, across the state, and there was one day that he rode tandem bike with me. Prior to that, he was riding uh, his uh, single bike. So here he is, off deep brain stimulation. You can see he has a significant tremor. I'm holding a laptop computer for him to do some movement tasks on. This is in the field testing, obviously. Uh, this was our off DBS, so he kept his DBS stimulators off. So here he is, four hours post-exercise. It was a 50-mile ride, took us about four hours. And you can see his tremors are significantly declined, and uh, he's, he's doing pretty well there. Now, the first or most obvious question is, how long did that last? Um, we don't know in this case, because uh, this was a social setting, and we didn't want to just keep him off his stimulators and to see when it came back. But to me, this was, you know, being a DBS guy, this really struck me, and I was like, okay, now we need to figure out how are we potentially, or how can we potentially close the gap between these really promising animal studies and the, to, to, to at that point, the studies from humans that were not as promising. So we started to think about it, and I started thinking about what's going on on a tandem bike. Well, if you think of a tandem, uh, both people have to pedal at the same rate because the front and rear people are, are linked mechanically via a chain. And so when I would pedal with Dave or with uh, Kathy uh, and other patients, I would typically pedal at 80 to 90 RPMs, whereas on their own, they pedaled around 50 RPMs. So in essence, what I was doing is I was forcing them, sans the electricity, to pedal at a faster rate that they, than they could on their own. And so the other thing that we were looking at, and that is very similar to what we're doing or what we do with the animals with the forced exercise, right? Um, again, we're making them exercise faster than they can on their own. 
Um, a couple things to remember or note, though, is that it's certainly you're aerobic, so you have to get your heart rate up. And we've been using 65 to 80 percent of their target heart rate zone, um, based on American College of Sports Medicine uh, uh, requirements. The other fact is that it's really key is that the participant is not passive. So it's really easy to put a motor on a bike or anything and just turn it on and get your legs to be moved really quickly. So it's really important to, to understand that that's not what forced exercise is. The participant is actually actively contributing to the movement. Because if they don't contribute to the movement, you're not going to see any change in function. And we have a lot of studies on that with, with Parkinson's, but even a larger set on patients with stroke. You can move their arm, and they actually show no functional gains and no changes in the brain unless they actively move as well. So we think of extra forced exercise, though we call it forced, and that may have a negative connotation. Uh, we really almost think of it as sort of a helping hand or a helping or assistive type uh, exercise. So where are, we, where are we now? Well, we've come from the cornfields uh, in just an observation to clinical trial to, uh, to actual practice. Um, our initial study in 2007, where we uh, did a clinical study, initial clinical study with an actual tandem bike, to now that we have developed a, uh, a motor-driven cycle, again, with an algorithm that controls the contribution of the motor while monitoring the contribution of the patient. It's important to note that you, have, you can't just put a motor on a cycle and spin someone's legs really quickly. So what's the rationale? Certainly, again, I'll, I'll run through this quickly um, in terms of uh, just showing you that the, the important part here is that what we're trying to do is to augment the voluntary activities of the Parkinson's patient to get them to exercise at a rate faster than they could on their own. So we had, uh, in our initial study, our intervention was uh, we randomly assigned patients to a forced versus voluntary group. They came into the lab three times a week uh, for eight weeks. We did a 10-minute uh, warm-up and a 10-minute cool-down. In between there, we did a 40-minute uh, set. The forced exercise group pedaled at 80 to 90 RPMs, whereas the uh, voluntary group pedaled at whatever rate they wanted but they both were observed or, or monitored by an exercise physiologist and also were exercising at the same aerobic intensity. So the only difference, so their heart rates were about the same. The only difference was the voluntary group pedaled at whatever rate they wanted to pedal at and the forced group pedaled on a, on a tandem with one of my postdocs uh, at a rate of 80 to 90 RPMs. So again, the uh, forced group uh, was pedaling faster than the voluntary group, turned out to be about 42% faster. Uh, and this is some, some data that, uh, that I, I'll, I'll talk about. You know, Davis can probably appreciate it uh, more than anyone in terms of pedal symmetry. So if you, what we did is we measured the amount of torque or force that each, that each foot is producing during a pedaling stroke. And what I really just want to show you or have you focus on is both at the top two plots, both patients uh, in voluntary exercise and forced exercise produced an asymmetry. One leg produced more force than the other, which is not terribly surprising, right? Um, but then after eight weeks of exercise, if you look on the bottom plots, you can see the voluntary, again in, in red is the right leg and blue is the left leg, they still have this asymmetrical pedaling pattern. But the patient in the forced exercise group who we've augmented their pedaling rate um, now has a little bit more symmetry between the two limbs. So again, we find this encouraging, one, in the sense that we're improving, potentially improving lower extremity function. And now we're engaged in studies to see what are the specific effects of that in terms of gait and postural stability. But the other part that was really exciting for us was the changes in upper extremity function. So this is a patient who was randomized to the uh, forced exercise group. And when I give this talk to undergraduates, I have to explain that these are canceled checks because none of them know that. Um, but uh, if you look at her handwriting, and I have circled that in the red there, uh, in 1996, that was prior to her diagnosis, she was diagnosed in uh, 98, and you can see her handwriting has progressively decreased for, and uh, becomes more and more Ill Ill illegible. Uh, 2006, it's pretty illegible. And then when she enrolled in our study, uh, up on the upper right, you can see 
a big transition there. Her handwriting is very poor, and she's now gone to typing her checks, which for her was a significant decrease in quality of life because she's a check writer. Um, she did eight weeks of forced exercise, and that's at the EOT slide there, or graph, and you can see she's writing her checks again, and her handwriting has increased or is improved. Um, so again, we're very encouraged by this because again, th this was an intervention where we were exercising the lower extremities. We weren't doing anything with the upper extremities, yet she was showing some improvements in her handwriting and upper extremity function. And then we tested her again four weeks later, post end of treatment, so she had stopped exercising. And you can see her handwriting had de has uh, uh, regressed a little bit, but it's certainly better than when she started the project. And, uh, it looks like it's probably somewhere around the 2006 uh, area. So that's something, again, you don't publish these things, but these are things that patients tell us and note when they're talking to us in terms of what they, what they experienced during the trials. So this is, these are data that we've published. Uh, again, on the left is just a, a measure of uh, VO2 max, so that's just a measure of fitness. Uh, basically, what this says is that Parkinson's patients, whether you exercise on a voluntary bicycle or the forced mode, you show improvements in the cardiovascular function. So that's good. So the bottom line there is get out and exercise. Do some movement because you can experience the benefits of exercise. On the right hand, we see that those are the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale scores. And these are scores that you probably have experienced when you go to your movement disorders neurologist. They ask you to do things like this, or move your hands, or they'll do a, a walking test or a push-pull test. Uh, and so what we found here was that after eight weeks of exercise in yellow, the individuals in the forced group had a 35% improvement in motor function compared to baseline data. So again, we're trying to use this to potentially augment or as an adjunct to medication and, uh, and possibly surgical intervention. So again, that was our first evidence that we have this global change in motor function. So these are some uh, very recent data that we've uh, gathered. Um, and it really, it, it gathered from, we gathered them because of some comments that uh, three patients made to us during the trial. One said, uh, I, I smelled diesel fuel for the first time in 10 years today. And we were like, oh, that's interesting. And then the other said, I went in and I told my wife, the house smells like onions. And she said, you can't smell onions. And uh, he said, well, I can now. And the other was, and this was the most, uh, the one that led us to do this test. He said, you know, I never thought I had body odor, but now I start to smell, I have body odor. And, uh, and so his, his olfaction or his smell was improved. And so what we did is we started uh, collecting data using the, the UPSET, the University of Pennsylvania Smell Identification Test. Basically, it's a scratch and sniff test. Uh, and what we found, which was very interesting, is that we showed these improvements in uh, olfaction. And as many of you know and maybe have experienced, loss of olfaction is typically, or loss of smell, is really, is often uh, a very, considered a very early non-motor sign of Parkinson's. And so now we have this ability, or what appears to be, that we're actually improving uh, uh, olfaction levels in these individuals. So those are represented in the, uh, in the blue, and it's a, as a function of pedaling rate. And so what you see there is individuals who pedaled over 85 RPMs or 83 RPMs mostly, uh, showed improvements or got better in their olfaction. Now you'll also see that there are a couple red dots there, and those are patients who were in a voluntary group. They happen to be able to pedal uh, at a relatively high rate. Uh, so this goes to this concept of maybe everybody doesn't necessarily need forced exercise, but it points to this idea that it's more of a rate issue. So we were interested in these data, and we were like, okay, if we're changing handwriting, we're changing upper extremity function, and uh, olfaction, then we must be changing something in the brain. So we brought 10 patients in, had them do uh, uh, three sessions, one with the no medication, uh, medication, and then no meds plus exercise at 80 to 90 RPMs. And then we put them in a scanner to look at their pattern of brain activation uh, under these three different conditions. And essentially what we see here is the post-exercise, off, ex off meds, and then on medication. And I want to focus your attention on the, the two outer uh, MRI scans there, and these are average for 10 patients. You can see on medication on the right, we have activation within the basal ganglia uh, in the middle there. Uh, so that's suggesting medication's working. Post-exercise, 
we see, again, this is off medication, we see a very similar pattern of results. So what it suggests is that we are actually changing brain function through this mode of exercise. So in fact, exercise is uh, most likely medicine for Parkinson's. So summary, uh, aerobic exercise improves cardiovascular fitness. So get out and try to move in an aerobic standpoint from a perspective. Uh, forced exercise result results are encouraging. We've had, uh, it, and it looks like the rate of exercise is very important in terms of symptom relief. Uh, we've had patients that are uh, able to reduce medication. Again, I'm a PhD, not an MD, so I would never suggest uh, anyone exercise and then try to reduce their medications. And we're actually looking at that uh, question systematically now to determine if patients can uh, reduce medication during exercise. Um, and then again, these very encouraging data with respect to changes in olfaction. So before you start an exercise program, certainly want you to consult your movement disorders neurologist, and if you have a heart condition, your cardiologist. Um, and again, we would recommend a relatively high intensity if possible, uh, 65 to 85% of your, your target heart rate zone. Um, and one of the things that we would suggest is to reduce your resistance and try to increase the pedaling rate or exercise rate, uh, but do it in a safe manner, whether it's stationary cycling, treadmill uh, training, or even stationary rowing. Uh, again, we find that a partner or a group setting appeals to most people, uh, and we want to make sure that you're safe, so we're not recommending you go buy a bike and you know, take to the streets of Phoenix or Las Vegas or wherever you're, you're from. Um, we are starting programs, and we have existing programs uh, called Pedaling for Parkinson's at the Y. Uh, right now we have them in Seattle, Grand Haven, uh, Cleveland, Ann Arbor, and Sarasota. Uh, so if there are any individuals who would be interested in uh, starting programs, we just provide the YMCA the guidance and the, the protocols. Again, this is our effort to get out into the community and to get these things to, to you rather than taking five years to get them published and then finally bringing them to you. And I think that's consistent with Davis's message with respect to living well now and get, getting these things out to patients as quickly as possible. So. Uh, you know, the other thing is be an active participant in your treatment, uh, and whether that means exercising on a daily or three times a week basis, do it. The other part is uh, be a critical consumer of information from your neurologist. Uh, ask them questions, and if you don't understand, ask them more questions. It's okay. Um, so the question we get a lot is, does it have to be forced exercise only? Uh, and I'll put this slide up from Nan Little from Seattle. She says, first I bike, then I fish. So Nan is one of those who can pedal at 80 RPMs on her own, and she uh, basically brings her trainer everywhere she goes. So they're out in uh, Montana fishing or something, and for her, she starts her morning off with the exercise, and that allows her to then uh, fish. So is exercise medicine for Parkinson's disease? Uh, the guy on the left is my brother with a patient, so that type of exercise is yes. He's actively contributing. But the exercise on the right, my son, if you notice where his feet are, that is not exercise. So just because you're on the bike doesn't mean you're actually getting exercise. So that's where you need to be an active exerciser. So thank you very much. <laughs>